it keeps a third of us alive. It also keeps our roses red and our corn stalks high. It falls from above, and it was the big prize in a war. It's the recycled waste of restaurants, restrooms, and trash bins. It's dredged from ancient seas and drenched in modern solutions. Dripped, dropped, or dumped. Now, fertilizer on Modern Marbles. Every day around the world, six and a half billion of us need to eat. For food, we rely on the earth, where the soil provides nutrients to feed our crops. But those nutrients are limited. Every time we harvest corn or tomatoes or lettuce or anything from that field, we're also harvesting the nutrients that are in that crop. So when we continually harvest things from the field, we have to replace them where the soil becomes depleted. Enter fertilizers, the nutrient-rich elixirs that make it possible to reuse the land, to grow the crops that feed the world. In 2006, we spread over 150 million tons of fertilizer around the globe. It's estimated that without it, two billion of us would starve. Fertilizer's power is contained in three key nutrients, all with a vital role to play in plant health. Nitrogen promotes growth by driving photosynthesis and transferring light into usable chemical energy. Phosphate contains compounds that both store and release life-sustaining energy within the plant on the cellular level. And potassium helps to regulate the water content of a plant by controlling the opening and closing of its pores. But before any of them become fertilizer, the big three nutrients have to be harvested. And Potash Corp is doing just that at its PCS phosphate mine in Aurora, North Carolina. This is where fertilizer begins. We bring it from the ancient bed where it was naturally deposited back onto the surface where we can use it in today's world. Millions of years ago, this 250-acre hole was part of an ocean. Now it's a graveyard for the ancient sharks, whales, and various sea creatures that died here. Pulverized within their remains is phosphate, a nutrient picked up in the diet and stored in bones. We're now standing 30 feet below sea level, reaching down into an ancient deposit of marine life that laid the phosphorus down. We're mining that phosphate out, bringing it back to the surface where we can then use it. He's now swinging around placing it under a pile here where we make it usable as a fertilizer. Geologists estimate that this deposit will continue to supply phosphate for at least 90 more years. But it doesn't come easily. It takes some of the sturdiest and most powerful machines ever made to pry it from the earth. The boom on the length of a drag line is about the length of a football field. 300 feet long, leading down to the drag line itself, which is about a 10 million pound machine. 8,000 horsepower runs it through an electrical cord. These are the chain links that lead to the drag line bucket. Each link is about the length of my arm or so. The drag line bucket is really the primary tool that we use to dig the phosphate. This particular one is about the size of a two car garage. 75 cubic yards and scoops about 60 tons of material with each scoop. Manned and moving every hour of every day, this drag line pulls out over 4 million tons of phosphate ore annually. Once the ore is up, it gets wet for its journey into the modern world of fertilizer production. We then use water pressure, 250 PSI water pressure to, to slurry this water, to mix it with the ore, and, and then we pump it, run it through these pumps, down through this pipeline, and all the way to the mill. At the mill, the slurry enters a tangled maze of pipes, pumps, and waterways, all designed to isolate phosphate from earth and turn it into usable fertilizer. The phosphate ore slurry from the mine is pumped up to the mill and brought through this screening process where the oversized material is removed. The slurry hops across a vibrating screen, 
where the finer material falls through slits. The larger material continues to march toward the edge. After a shiver, the phosphate and sand are thickened with plant oil into a kind of milkshake. This gives the phosphate something to cling on to before it enters the paddle line. The phosphate and sand mixture that has been conditioned now enters these flotation cells. We introduce air bubbles into the bottom of the tank and we skim off the phosphate from the top because the phosphate has an affinity for that air bubble and attaches to it. You can see a lot of phosphate being recovered by this first cell. As we move down the cells, you see less and less phosphate being recovered. The phosphate is still not quite ready for plants to digest. It needs a little boost from science. So it's off to another facility, where it's combined with sulfuric acid to make phosphoric acid, the same stuff used to remove rust and add the bite in soft drinks. Piped inside a rotating drum, the phosphoric acid joins some ammonia and a batch of already made granular fertilizer. Once it's all mixed together, the phosphate fertilizer is complete. And here we have one of our final products, a granular ammonium phosphate. Through mining, we're able to bring that phosphate ore body to the surface. And then through the chemical processes, we're able to make that a soluble product so that we have this granular fertilizer product that can be used to help feed the world. But phosphate is just one of three key nutrients required by plants. The second is potassium. It too is mined from ancient deposits. These formed by evaporated seawater. Except this nutrient is buried in dirt more than 3,000 feet underground. Here, boring machines work around the clock to bring it to the surface. Inside the mill, the raw material is crushed and cleaned to separate clay and salt from the potassium. The potassium is then dried and sized. Nitrogen is the third and most used of the big three nutrients. It's pulled from the air. Approximately 80% of the atmosphere that we breathe is nitrogen. However, that's not in a form that plants can use. Nitrogen fertilizers are made by reacting natural gas, steam, and air to form anhydrous ammonia, which is then reacted with air to make nitric acid. Then nitric acid is combined with anhydrous ammonia to make ammonium nitrate, one of several soluble nitrogen-based fertilizers. But just as ammonia nitrate can help build life, it can also take it away as a potential agent in explosives. Ironically, this characteristic was the catalyst for the commercial fertilizer industry. During World War II, American munitions factories worked overtime to produce stockpiles of ammonium nitrate for bombs. After the war, the factories were stuck with a surplus. They retooled to manufacture nitrogen-based fertilizers. Following World War II, as nitrogen fertilizers became available, farmers now had an affordable source of nitrogen that could be used to improve crop yields. But mining the earth and air aren't the only ways to make fertilizer. Nutrients can also be harvested from crops themselves. And that's exactly what's being dished out at the Slanted Door restaurant in San Francisco, California. So basically all the food scrap that's coming from the kitchen, uh, whatnot, uh, coming to this uh, cleaning area, and it goes into this green bin here. As a restaurant, we generate a lot of waste. And and one of these bins here, you look at like this, we empty this time probably like uh, five times a day. This is the table scraps that we throw away and hopefully we'll come back in full circle and come to bed us back on the table and a nice product. As part of a recycling program growing across the country, food scraps and leftovers are collected and made into fertilizer. The process begins at Jepson Prairie Organics in Vacaville, California where every day, 200 tons of food waste is dumped in a heap. In there are all the nutrients an organic fertilizer chef needs for today's recipe. 
compost. Right here is a good example of what we get on a daily basis. You've got all kinds of organics, anything from shrubbery to cardboard, paper. You got the bread, nice French roll there. You got soup bone, good in calcium. You got your high protein fish. That's some potassium there, bananas, and some good USDA pork fat. Now that the ingredients are all laid out, let's get started. First, the recipe calls for some sorting to separate the food waste from everything else that was dumped into the recycling bins. At the pre-screen station, dump the mess in a rotating steel barrel, where four-inch holes shift the smaller food waste onto a conveyor below. Set aside for later use. Next, carefully separate any unusable inorganic material that did not fall through the sifter. The bigger material comes up the picking station conveyor, which in is picked manually for contaminants like metals and concrete and plastics. Plastic is the biggest killer. Turtles? Turtles are compostable. <laughs> if it's organic, it stays. Weirdest things we've found, we're, we've had an engine block. One time we had some guns. You get somebody's hat. Once the sorting is complete, put the oversized material into an industrial grinder. Mix in the food waste set aside earlier and place it all in a pile. Add the final ingredient, our mystery item. Leftovers and half-eaten meals from a nearby 3,000 bed prison. It's all table scraps. Uh, it's whatever they have for dinner, uh, beans, rice. We get uh, probably 10 tons of that every other day. We mix it in with the already ground up stuff to get the moisture because you need lots of moisture to compost. And it's pretty nasty and it smells like lunch. After you've recovered, blend it all together with a couple of front loaders and it's time to put it in the compost oven. Actually, it's more like a sausage maker with an air filter inside. Finally, leave it alone for 60 days and let Mother Nature cook some compost. To start the process, air is pumped inside the bag. This activates tiny microbes into a feeding frenzy. These organic predators break down the matter into small enough pieces for plants to digest. The activity also creates heat which can kill some harmful bacteria. When you're finished with the composting process, what you like to have is a very stable material that can be added back to the soil. Generally, these stable materials do not release nutrients very quickly, but they provide a slow release or a long-term source of nutrients to the plant. After the bag is removed, the pile is aerated with a windrow turner, reducing the particle sizes even more. 30 days later, the material is screened one last time. What began as a pile of food waste is now an organic fertilizer containing nitrogen, phosphate, and potassium. The circle closes back in San Francisco, where restaurants serve vegetables that have been fertilized with compost made from their own scraps. A true organic San Francisco treat. But what's a farmer to do when it comes to choosing a fertilizer? Organic or inorganic? Chemical fertilizers are made to release nutrients with speed and power, qualities critical to a farmer's bottom line. Organic fertilizers are more dense and tend to meld into the soil. And their slow release gives soil long-term stability, perfect for wine growers who need their grapevines to get stronger year after year. What I need is the stable response out of fertilizers. I'm looking to slow everything down because I have plenty of materials such as compost to help me get the mineral to the plant root in enough time. Today, farmers and growers have a wide range of organic and commercial fertilizers to choose from. But before modern fertilizers, they had to search for their own sources. Some were dumped in their laps 
Others were just hanging around. It's dinner time outside the Frio Bat Cave in Garner Park, Texas. Every day at dusk between April and November, 40 million Mexican free-tailed bats leave their home for the evening feast. By the time they return, just before daybreak, they'll have consumed nearly 500 tons of mosquitoes. Back inside the cave, the bats will hang around for a bit and wait for nature's call. Then they'll litter the floor with some of the most powerful poop on Earth. A fertilizer called guano, Spanish for manure. John Sheely is here to harvest it. This cave has 26 and a half miles of explored passages. We're uh, currently going in the, I would have to say the third room, making the turn down into the uh, main room, which is roughly uh, two football fields in size. From talking to old timers in the past, they have cored down in this cave and gone 200 feet and they were still in guana in this room. Harvesting guano hasn't changed for centuries. It's straight from the bats behind and into the can. Why? Because as is guano is loaded with organic nitrogen, potassium, and phosphate. Not to mention 13 trace elements essential for plant growth. All manure is a product of what that animal ate. These mammals are eating meat. They're eating uh, toxic-free insects, moss and mosquitoes. Uh, we know where they went. We know where they live. And there's, there's nothing in here that can harm us. And don't let its light, fluffy texture fool you. Guano is a rare, soluble organic fertilizer. When a solution of it hits the soil, its nutrients move like a bat out of hell. But bat guano isn't the only highly prized fertilizer found in vast deposits. Birds also drop a mighty guano bomb. So powerful, in fact, that a war was actually fought over it. In the mid-1800s, the world's population was growing rapidly. Without a chemical fertilizer industry to meet food demand, Organic fertilizer was a precious commodity. Bird guano was one of the most popular. In 1840, Chile, Bolivia, and Peru hit the guano jackpot when they discovered that along their western coasts lay the world's largest bird guano deposit. Seabirds will go out, catch fish during the day, come back at night, and the excrement around their nests accumulates. The dried excrement can be 20, 30, 40 feet deep as it accumulates over the centuries. And in these low rainfall environments, it never gets washed away. The guano gold mine was measured at several million tons, nearly a billion dollars worth on the open market. It wasn't long before the battle for bird droppings was on. In 1879, Chile went to war with Bolivia. Bolivia allied itself with Peru. The war lasted five years. And when it was over, Chile had kicked the guano out of its two neighbors. The map was redrawn. Bolivia is now landlocked because of the war over bird poop. The spoils would only last so long. By the 20th century, the guano deposit was nearly depleted. Fortunately for plants and farmers everywhere, bat and bird guano aren't the only stinky stuff around. Today, there's a new dew rising, worm castings. Through a process called vermicomposting, worms are fed a steady diet of cow manure. The worms, in turn, will excrete a powerful fertilizer of their own. The idea is that by double dipping, organic matter is broken down to such an extent that it releases nutrients more quickly to plants. Warning. The process is not for the faint of heart. Here's how it works. At coin farms, 
a highly respected enterprise in upstate New York. Dairy cows are busy making the same mess that's been fertilizing fields since the beginning of crop production. Early farmers made the observation that where there was manure, the plants around that organic matter are stronger and look better. Working back and forth across this slimy floor, a mechanical pooper scooper slowly scrapes the cow manure toward the center of the barn. These piles of dung may look repulsive, but to Tom Hurley, owner of Worm Power in Avon, New York, this barn floor is overflowing with nutrients, just waiting to be harnessed. This is where the vermicomposting process begins. This is my feedstock right here. Back into the cows, the cow flop falls down in the aisle. The manure is pushed down the aisle, down in here to the central way where it falls into the sump. Comes down in here, there's 80,000 gallons of manure and it's being agitated, pumped around and around and around. The pool of poop is filled with traces of nitrogen, phosphate, and potassium. But worms like their dinner on the dryer side. It's pumped up put into this big hopper here where it's gonna be fed into the separator. The separator is nothing more than a giant squeeze press, just like when you're making wine or uh, apple cider. It's squeezed, we get the uh, solids here out of the end. And you can see it's all fibrous from the uh, bedding from the cow and also from their diet. And then the juice comes out the pipe down here at the bottom. The separated liquid travels to a million gallon manure lagoon. Later, so as not to waste a drop, the nose-rotting liquid will be sent to a corn pasture to fertilize feed for the same cows that made it. Meanwhile, the separated dry manure is trucked to the vermicompost plant. But before it's fed to the worms, it needs to be broken down into smaller portions. The best way to do that is to compost it with an active organic material, like rotting cattle feed. Normally, the manure would take several months to decompose. That's where the worms come in. Here we are. This is the heart of the vermicomposting operation. In this room, we have about 7 million earthworms living and breeding. Uh, each one of these beds is about 1,000 square feet of surface area. We've taken that manure, we've composted it, and now we're feeding it to the worms. The worms are multiplying in here. All they're doing is eating and breeding, and our job is to keep them fat, dumb, and happy. They're in here eating away like mad. And you can see, we got lots of earthworms. Food and sex in a specially made trough. This may seem like worm heaven, but these lucky little critters are providing a crucial step in breaking down the big three nutrients. They have a gizzard like a chicken. They ingest the particle, they fragment it up, they accelerate decomposition. Uh, regular composting, it would take six to nine months to get a stable end product. 21 days ago, this was manure. 40 days in here, and then I'm all done. Inside the trough, the worms work in a counterflow system. The original compost is spread on the top of the bed. The worms then move up to eat. After digestion, they expel particles called castings. A winch then pulls a bar through the trough, which skims off a layer of castings to the bottom. Compost is then added back on top of the trough, and the process continues. 45 days later, the vermicastings are calmly shaken onto a conveyor below, and the final product slowly rides off to the packaging plant. Here's the black rain falling. 60 days ago, that was manure. Now it's beautiful, rich, earthy smelling material. Plant the seed in it, jump back before the shoot comes and hits you in the eye. Worms can poop great fertilizer, and cows and bats can too. So what about the hairless ape? At one of New Jersey's finest golf courses, Superintendent Roger Stewart Jr. is making sure his fairways and greens are in peak condition. This year alone, he and his crew will feed the grass with nearly 100 tons of prime organic fertilizer. Well, the thing we really like about this fertilizer is that it, uh, it's a natural organic product because of the slow release rate, the fertilizer lasts a long time, and we don't have to go out as often to put it on. In New Jersey, the weather can be harsh. Keeping the grass green requires a robust fertilizer, something like human waste. It really doesn't bother me that it comes from human waste. 
the product that comes out here doesn't look anything like the human waste did when it started out. Actually, it looked like this, a river of mortal muck slithering through the New Jersey sewage system. On any given day, the wave moves through morning rush hour and picks up steam until finally the sludge tsunami enters the Ocean County sewage treatment plant. In any wastewater treatment plant, our flow rates during the course of the day pretty much follow people's normal habits. During the nighttime, early morning hours after midnight, our flows are very low. And then during the day, as people become active, six, seven o'clock in the morning, our flows pick up. The first order of business is to remove any non-organic waste with a climber screen. The mechanical bar screens screen out just about any type of material that's found uh, that can be flushed down the toilet or go down a drain. And uh, it's an array of rag material, some tissue paper, all-purpose cleaners, condoms, feminine applicators, anything that could potentially be harmful to our downstream treatment plant equipment. Downstream, the filtered sludge enters a dome structure called a primary clarifier. Inside is a circular tank holding 686,000 gallons of human wastewater. The stench is enough to make a grown man cry. The clarifier is designed to let gravity do most of the work. Heavy particles fall to the bottom of the tank. Oil-based liquids rise to the top. What you see on the surface is a skimmer mechanism. Its purpose is to remove any floating grease, oil, fats, anything that passes through that our bar screens don't catch that floats on the surface. But the real action is taking place below the surface. The primary tank has a floor that's sloped toward a hopper in the center. A few inches above the bottom, an iron rake extends in both directions to the edge of the tank. At the rate of nine feet per minute, the rake moves around the tank and slowly pushes the heavy sludge toward the center. From there, it's pumped into anaerobic digesters. The sludge will then mix in the digester tanks for 15 to 30 days. Microorganisms will begin to break it down and stabilize the solids, killing unwanted bacteria in the process. Then it needs to lose some water weight. When the sludge comes across the belt initially, it's out of 4% solids or 96% water. This section is called the gravity belt section, and the gravity belt section allows the water to freely flow through the fabric. Uh, and it's whatever comes out by gravity all by itself. It will drop out here and drop straight down, and that water is collected and sent back to the head of our plant. After gravity has done everything it can, a high-pressure roller squeezes out another round of water. The solids are starting to look like, and feel, like fertilizer. At this point in time, the sludge has already been treated. It's, it's virtually bacteria-free. Our fertilizer is 5% nitrogen, 5% phosphorus, and 0% potassium. Plus, there are other micronutrients in here also, which are good for plant growth. One more hard push through a press, and it's out. In the industry, the waste is now called cake. And this cake is headed for a blow dry. We are now going to mix it with some already dried material, which is in that particular bin over there. The two of them come together in this mixer. In this mixer, we will take the, the cake and the solids up to 60% dry material. At that point in time, the pellets are preformed and ready to go into the dryer. Three passes through the 1,200 degree Fahrenheit dryer, and any bacteria strong enough to make it to this point are laid to rest. And that's a good thing, because untreated human waste can transport viral and bacterial diseases, like hepatitis, typhoid, and cholera. On final approach, the cake is finally screened to order, and here it comes. This is the final product. It started out as a flush of a toilet. It is now a commodity for the fertilizer industry, made to the specifications of that industry. Even before modern processing, human waste was commonly used as a fertilizer. Only in the ancient world, deposits were more direct. 
The ancient Greeks actually dig canals that would leave the city, carrying the human waste out to the olive groves. Today, the use of sewage sludge is controversial. Unlike the Greeks' canals, America's sewer systems carry more than human waste. The constituents in the sewer treatment plant then contain whatever is flowing into the sewer that day. It may be waste from a household, it could be from an industry, it could be runoff from a parking lot or a street. Still, the government and the industry are comfortable that with treatment, sewage sludge fertilizer is perfectly safe. In 1991, the industry wisely decided on a name change. Human waste and sewage sludge became biosolids. In 2006, three and a half million tons of dried biosolids were sold as fertilizer in the US. Sounds like a lot, but it's still less than 1% of the overall market. That percentage may increase if others are as satisfied as the superintendent of the Princeton Golf Course. There's certainly no danger to any of the people who play golf here. I think our members uh, want us to act in an environmentally responsible way. And we think we're participating in that cause and doing it in a, in a way that benefits the golf course because of the fertilizer aspect of it. But we're also doing our part to recycle products like this. For animal, vegetable, or mineral, fertilizer has to be applied to work its magic. That can result in a thrill ride that requires the quickness and precision of a NASCAR pit crew. At the end of a small dirt airstrip in central California, the ground crew for a crop dusting operation is prepping for an incoming plane. This is part of the art of applying fertilizer. The white pellets are uh, nitrogen, and the green pellets are phosphate. With the fertilizer being pelletized like this, it flows out of the airplane better, which gives us a, a more even distribution. In one application, the farmer can get all the essential uh, nutrients that he needs with one fertilizer application to produce the crop of rice. Coming in after the third of what will be 30 runs today, pilot Robert DeTunk touches down and hustles into position for a fast turnaround. It's like a NASCAR pit stop. The truck comes up, we put 3,000 pounds in the fertilizer in just a matter of less than a minute. The aircraft is back in the air. Speed, time, everything is focused on doing the job as quick as we can because in our business, time is money. It's that simple. The less time we're here, the less time we're in the ground, the less fuel we burn, the faster we get the job done and the faster we move to the next field. Okay, we got a load we're getting ready to uh, power up and get ready to take off again. They did pretty good that time. They got a pretty quick turnaround. As the season goes on, it'll get faster and faster. There we go. Crop duster pilots have always had a bit of a daredevil persona. Many earned their wings over less friendly territory during World War II. After the war, with pilots out of work and a surplus of training biplanes rusting away in storage, an aerial bombardment began over America's farmlands. Soon, pesticides and fertilizers were falling from the sky. Any crop growing in an open field could benefit. And the only thing that could keep a pilot on the ground was bad weather. Now pilots fertilize 25% of U.S. farmlands every year. Okay, here we go. We got them lined up. And I'm diving into the field. And the fertilizer is now coming out of the air. I'm checking to make sure that I can see fertilizer coming out, making sure that uh, everything looks right. Try to fly about power line height so we get a good spread on the fertilizer. And here we go. We pull up at the end of the turn. Just like it right, it did the plan. This 18502B turbine-powered aircraft can cover up to 1,000 acres on a typical day. 
Each load drops electronically through a five-gate steel dispenser. Open the gate, and a fertilizer rains a falling. Long before aircraft started applying fertilizer, farmers used everything from pitchforks to horse-pulled manure carts. With the gas engine came tractors and rotary spreaders. Today, liquid fertilizers flow through sprayers mounted on tractors, planes, and irrigation systems. Liquid fertilizers have one advantage over dry. They can be applied more evenly, although both act the same once they're in the soil. Despite the advances, delivery systems haven't quite met the farmer's ultimate goal. Get the right fertilizer on the right place at the right time. Until now. Advanced soil testing techniques allow farmers to find out exactly what nutrients are lacking. And companies like Entech Industries in Ukiah, California, are looking at crop nutrition from a different direction. They've developed the Green Seeker, a tractor-mounted system that tests the plant instead of the soil. The Green Seeker system utilizes six sensors all across the boom. The sensors continuously take crop measurements every second. The sensor data is continuously analyzed to put the appropriate amount of nutrient on. This is done while the applicator is running through the field. Some parts of the field will accept more fertilizer. Other parts don't need any at all. This is what the sensor is telling the sprayer to do. The Green Seeker sensors emit red and infrared light onto the crop. Since green plants naturally reflect infrared and absorb red light to get energy, the plants that reflect less red light back to the sensor are generally less vigorous. These measurements from each sensor are averaged and sent to an interface module on the back of the sprayer. This information is then sent to the cab to the computer that tells the sprayer the appropriate amount of nutrient to apply to the crop. The decision for me to install this equipment on my sprayer here was economical. We're able to apply what we need where we need it, and then we're not over fertilizing either. Farmers are also getting some guidance from above with global positioning satellites. The GPS system on this machine receives a signal from a satellite and actually drives this machine in a straight line without overlap. On the front, there's a light bar mounted there out on the hood and you can watch it and it's tied to the GPS. The light bar shows zero, which means I'm dead on path. I reach down here and tap this floor switch and it locks it on and then from there on, I don't have to touch the steering wheel and that red mark is showing where we've applied product. What that enables me to do is to see spots that I may have missed in the field or prevents me from causing to have an overlap. With the latest fertilizing techniques, farmers can be gentler on the land, reduce labor costs, and increase yields like never before. My great-grandpa would be amazed. The computers are applying it now. It's went from using manure left over from your feedlot to being able to precisionally place the exact amount you need in the exact spots you need. But there are still other ways to get plants the nutrients they need. And one of those ways has been buried in mystery for millions of years. Many experts predict that by the year 2030, the world's population will swell to 8 billion. To meet demand, food production will have to increase. And to make that happen, we'll need to get more nutrients to more crops than ever before. Dr. Mike Amaranthus is looking for help in lowly places. He's focusing on a key building block of all plant life, mycorrhizae, or fungus root. It's not a fertilizer. Instead, it's a web of microscopic tentacles that help plant roots absorb soil nutrients. And it's been doing that for 450 million years, when plants only existed underwater and the fungi sprouted on what was then barren land. 
It was the fortuitous marriage of a primitive fungus and aquatic plants that allowed plants to leave their marine environments and colonize their surface. And this particular fungi is called mycorrhizal fungi. So it's been fundamental to life on Earth as we know it. Once it made the evolutionary leap, the fungus spread across the globe. And everywhere it went, plants soon followed. Today, mycorrhizal fungi live in 95% of the Earth's undisturbed habitat, the habitat that fertilizes itself with recycled organic material provided by the fungus. The fungi work in a symbiotic relationship with the plant root. The fungi receive sugar from the root. In exchange, they absorb and send soil nutrients back for the plant. When those nutrients are depleted, the fungi simply reach further into the soil for more. And they increase the root system several hundred to several thousand times. So instead of having only 20% of your fertilizer utilized, you can have 90 or 100% of it utilized. At their facility in Grants Pass, Oregon, the crew at Mycorrhizal Applications grows the fungi for distribution in the commercial market. In these 1,000-pound bags surrounding us is where the process begins. And that process requires a living host. This hay-like substance are actually the roots of the crop that was used to grow the mycorrhizal seeds. We collect the seeds of the mycorrhiza and we use those seeds to produce the next generation of mycorrhizal plants. The seeds, or spores, are then germinated in a sugar solution. After they grow up, the fungi become twisted webs of hungry fibers. The microscopic fungi seeds are then mixed with a clay material and made into granules. The fungi are ready to help some depleted soil return to life. The reason we use mycorrhizal fungus is because the plant roots and the plants, when they go into the local soils around here, the soils have been usually a construction site. Uh, they've been devastated. There's no microorganisms. There's no beneficial bacteria in the soils. So we put it in as kind of an insurance policy. That's how we started using it. Mycorrhizal Applications ships half a million pounds of the fungi to customers around the globe. Although its use is in its early stages, the effect of the mycorrhizal fungus on crop production looks promising. Independent research shows up to a 20% increase in corn, wheat, vegetable, and fruit yields when farmers combine the fungus with fertilizers. And as it did 460 million years ago, it has the potential to help turn vast areas of barren desert into productive croplands. It could be a match made in fertilizer heaven. And as we move deeper into the 21st century, we can be thankful for the soil nutrients that keep us alive. For whether it's chemical or organic, mined, minced, or manured, fertilizer makes it possible to feed our growing population on an all-too-finite planet.